not given our consent to be ruled over. We're given our consent for not our leaders, but men and women who keep their oath to serve us by following the rule of law. And now, Dr. Greg Brandon on the path to liberty. Well, thank you again for a, uh, another opportunity to spend time talking today about our, our wonderful country and our state. Today on the way uh, driving the studio today, I was thinking what topics to talk about and what we're going to articulate. I'm going to go over some specific issues. I want to go over abortion, which tears us apart, but I think it should bond us together with life. I want to go over education, the true history of education. And then I'm deciding the last topic if I want to spend time on the Second Amendment or talk about Obamacare. But I want to use this segment to t- sort of tie those all together as an introduction. Um, I had a wonderful, um, saw a patient this morning before I came to, came over to the studio, and I ultrasounded a little 11 week, four day little baby. And later on, I'm going to show you a little picture of a little, beautiful little baby. But I really want to talk about these issues and this false paradigm we have built up right now. We have this idea during election cycle time that there truly is a a party of big government, we'll say, that loves to help everybody. And we have a party that says they believe in limited government, they believe in the sanctity of life, they believe in a small tax burden. But I think it's very clear that we're seeing there really is one party today. It's the progressive party. We have a party today that believes the state, the state itself, the government itself, is the arbitrator of all And they use force and coercion and compulsion to redistribute our wealth, our property, our time. See, that is not what this is about. This country, this experiment, was based upon the individual, the individual, private property, free trade, freely to associate. These central planners believe that society cannot run without the iron fist of a government dictating every single minutia of our life. When history is shown, when the American experiment is at it be- is as the best, was when it was completely free of those regulations and that iron fist where the individual could express their dreams and desires with success and failures. So I really think it's important that we don't try to immediately pick a side. We should take an issue and divide it up and take it back to that core foundational principle. Does it protect the individual? Again, a law, a law is only a constitutional law if it's based in God's natural law. We have today, as of October of last year, there are over 176,000 federal regulations, let let alone how many statues and, and sub particles and parts and titles that If you really look at us, we probably break law 30, 40 times a day. See, that is not what a legitimate government is. A legitimate government is only legitimate if it protects the individual's inalienable rights. Among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of your happiness. Today, we also have people on the Republican side that are now saying that things like public-private partnerships, green energy, That's a Republican way to go. No, that is not. No, that is not. We had our our President Obama, he ran in 2008. He ran on this public-private partnerships, which is a way of of doing a task that redistributes uh, wealth of the individual or the community, has the force and power of the regulatory power of a government, picking who they want to associate with who gets those contracts and then tying them to 50-year leases that actually make most of corporate welfare, this cronyism over here, and the individual suffers and pays. That's why it's very important that we understand at the core, as individuals, who or what we believe. You know, now, again, we have this idea that one side's evil, one side's good, regardless of what the side you decide to pick on. But all they are is arguing over the reins of power, of a government that our founders fought and died for. 
That's why it's important to understand the sovereign is you and me as individuals. That's why it's important to know our position in this. We're not mere serfs, mere plebes to do be at the behest of a government, be it local, be it state, or be it federal. That's why it's very important that when we take these issues apart, we never leave our foundation. We never leave that cornerstone. Remember, government came after individuals. Government is a tool in which the individuals and society together uses to better the individual and society as a whole, not to squeeze down and dehumanize the individual. So we talk about such things as health care or education. We talk about things such as abortion, pro-life, pro-choice. We must go back to those core principles at all times or we'll lose our, our way in this, this maze of what we're look, really looking forward to. And I do believe they play on our ignorance to always forget where we came from. That's why it's important right now that we take our time to educate ourselves. As Madison talks about, he said, knowledge will forever govern ignorance. And for those men that ought to be their own governors, they must understand the power that knowledge gives. See, the chains to be bound are not to you and me. It's to our representatives, our trustees, that we choose to hold that contract together, not the other way around. They are not our overlords. They are not our barons. They are not our superiors. They're supposed to be normal citizens who take up their time to give to civil service for two, four, six years and live under the laws they pass. That's why I love this opportunity I've been given to, uh, to speak this, but I've really seen the hypocrisy on both sides, quote unquote, that always run around from the true issues and try to power. In the idea of, of the life se- segment, I'm going to go over some things. I had some talks with some pastors that swore they would never, ever be used by, by a, a political party again. But yet we see pastors on both sides being used as a political, by each political party. So we have to go back to our warnings. Washington warned, have no factions. He warned about, you know, bonding to the oath of the rule of law if it's based in God's natural law. We have to talk back about the idea of the, of the American experiment of self-government. Self-government. This is, goes back to very simple things. In, the, in, in Scripture, it's the golden rule. Love your Lord and then treat everybody else as you want to be treated yourself. In, in, in other terms, it's your private property, your body, your work, your thoughts. And as long as you don't harm somebody else's, society's at its best. That's what, Matt, that's what Jefferson talked about in his first inaugural concerning our foreign policy. Malice to none and free trade with all. That's what we got to get back to. That's why it's important we look at every single issue through that spectrum. What we're going to do now is, I'm hoping in the future, in a couple of weeks or so, I really want to get people that may disagree with me. I love the internet, the, the, the internet of the opportunity for knowledge. But on Facebook, people sometimes love to attack me as an individual, attack other people. And there's not a give and take on that, I'll say, a good spirit of debate. What I'm hoping for is those who have actually uh, done it to myself, I hope they take our opportunity and go to our Facebook link on and come on to us. We could talk face to face. We could talk. We're going to work away. We could talk actually via Skype or on phone and take these issues, take them down and see where we agree or disagree. The biggest uh, sort of like sadness that came to me was so-called constitutional conservatives who... When you start bringing the Constitution back, they say, well, that's not good today. We got to we got to use other things to progress, to move the movement. Well, I don't think we have to wait, rock away from the foundations for the movement. Compromise will never, ever, ever fix this country. What we need to have done. I thank you. In the next segment, we'll take these issues one by one. Thank you very much.
Well, welcome back to Constitutional Path for Liberty. Last uh, week, we spent time talking over two of the most you know, difficult co- uh, topics to talk about, politics and God. Everybody wants to stay away from those, but that's actually the core of who we are. Today, I want to spend time talking about life, talking about the idea of that little baby in the womb who, from two cells, from different humans, a mommy and a daddy, become that one beautiful cell that becomes us, trillions of cells, with a soul, a spirit, a body, a mind, a thought, a dreams. I'm going to show you a, a, a little beautiful picture of a, a, a 11-week, four-day-old little baby I actually took today that shows fingers and toes and a, sm- a face, spine. So what is the role of a government in that aspect? What is a role of a government? There's a beautiful book that was made in, published in 1923 called The Declaration of Independence, A Study in History of the Political Ideas by Carl Lotus Becker. This was in high school and college's book was used for. It goes through the philosophy of the Declaration of Independence to our original writings prior to Jefferson's writing of this. This, Again, this was a standard textbook in the 20s. A standard textbook of the philosophy of America. The philosophy why men were born free. And now we... We don't read this kind of stuff. We have reality TV or we have other things going on that take us away from this. And I believe our political leaders, quote unquote, are banking that we don't know who we are. In an Aylborite, the first in Aylborite is life. And it does not mean just for conception. But it does mean from conception. It does not mean to natural passing, but it does mean to natural passing. It means that whole encompassing from the moment your DNA forms to the moment our creator stops that heart. That's why it's important to understand that words matter. They matter very importantly. That's why they sometimes people play with words to twist things to move it to their direction. So if the legitimate role of a government is to protect inalienable rights and the first inalienable right is life. Let's see what we put together here. In Article 5 of the Constitution, it says clearly that nobody, nobody should have their life taken from them. It's secure without due process. What, that's why the semantics on when a person is a person versus when a human is a human. Even Peter Sanger, the bioethicist at Princeton, who's very, he's, a, he's an atheist, he's, he's pro-abortion, he says we know life begins at conception. That's not even the debate. But that's not the point. The point is when is that human species become a person? His conclusion is when a person is, helps society in general. That means he's, you know, for euthanasia, abortion, uh, a person is disabled, it tears down society if one of us is weak. That's Plato. Plato's Republic was that between 15 and 45 was when you're better for the state. You have people today on, on, on the radio, on, the, on MSNBC or the news talking about, we have to get over this point to believe that children are actually from the parents. They're actually products and, and actually wards of the state. They're actually part of this collective. No, they're not. A family unit, a nucleus, came before government, before the state. So how do you go to a topic that's so inflammatory as life and, and abortion? I believe it's very important. You go with love and kindness. You go talk to them about when life begins. You t- talk about the science behind it. Uh, most studies show that the notochord, which is the beginning of the spine, there's actually nerve impulses around day 19 after conception. Uh, most literature shows that actually cardiac my uh, the, my, the contractility of the heart's around day 39. That proves and shows life. Yeah, lo- let alone the DNA fingerprint of the individual happens the moment conception occurs. And a society that will not protect the most innocence of life in the womb, right after birth, uh, during disability times, during sickness times, or at the end of life, is really not a society that loves life, dehumanizes us. That's why it's important 
that we look over these things and look back to the actually the foundation of what this country is found upon. The sad part I have is we have people on both sides. We'll talk about the big government and the so-called, uh, you know, religious right or conservatives um, that are fighting a fight about the power. Now, I want to go over the classic case of Roe v. Wade. As a Republican, my whole life, still am, I want the Republican of Cruz, uh, Paul, and Lee. That's the kind of party I'm trying to stay for, Massey and Amash and Jones, the party of the individual, the limited government, the sanctity of life. We're told Republicans, every four years, you must vote for any Republican president to change the Supreme Court because he must change the Supreme Court and get rid of Roe v. Wade. Well, let's go back to a couple of the powers of the Constitution. First off, the judicial branch has six functions. None of it is to make law. They're not the final arbitrator of that. When you, a couple weeks ago, we talked about Marshall and Jefferson talking about this idea that all branches are equal to interpret the Constitution back to its original intent. The original intent. That's why it's important to understand the Mayberry case, to understand the, uh, the Wicked Filburn case in 1942, to understand how the manipulation of words can move us to a different place from our beginning. So when we look about this, Roe v. Wade, again, the vote was 7 to 2. And of the seven that voted for the right of an abortion, five were Republicans. So it goes against the whole premise that a party, you know, a party can do that. Why do we compromise on that? And then also, in their, in their case of Roe v. Wade, if they knew when life began, they'd have a clear decision. So personhood was debated. That's why that word is very important. Now with the science, I'm an OBGYN, the science of life, how when a baby can leave the womb has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. Thank God to the science we have to take the baby out of that environment that may become hostile to an environment that still needs nurturing. And a full-term baby needs nurturing. So it's important to understand they're playing. Sometimes I believe people are playing politics with the sanctity of life on both sides to control our, our passions, they show pictures of babies or show pictures of children and try to manipulate us one way or the other to move what? It's always the state having more power. The state, the government dictating what's occurring, not occurring. That's why you must hold back and not be used by any party. You have these, um, un, 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 the moral majority on, on Mondays coming talking about social justice. Then you have the conservatives talking about, you know, the idea of sanctity of life. And they're both reading from the same scripture. Now, un, I, very clearly, our government is a civil government, but based upon Judeo-Christian principles. And that is that life is precious. Jeremiah 1.5, I knew you in the womb. Psalm 139.13, I knitted you in the womb. Your darkest most of your mother. They formed that beautiful baby. See, when you get the government involved playing this kind of religious decisions, things can move over. That's why it's important we go back to the idea of sanctity of life because I don't care if you believe or not believe, you believe in life. You're here, you exist yourself. That's why I think it's an important topic we do not run away from. It's like in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, even from the beginning of our country, there was an ar a more argument over the idea of slavery. They are not pieces of property. Those are human beings, human beings. The same can be said here. The little babies in the womb are human beings. We must stand up for truth. And truth is, life begins at conception. Truth is, we must not waver to that and vote for somebody of a, to get into power to make a difference when they're not making a difference because, because the structure we already have, when the federal government oversteps their bounds, the states have the power to stand up. We'll take that to the next segment. We'll go about Second Amendment, but I want to finish this uh, talk about life. And um, again, I'm honored that you're coming on to this, this um, you know, one hour a week to talk about our wonderful country and the position we have in it. Thank you very much. We 
have to, right now in this generation, ask a question that our founders had asked. Who or what is sovereign, and what is truly the legitimate role of government? And now, back to Dr. Greg Brandon on the path to liberty. Well, welcome back. I want to tie up the idea of sanctity of life and what the political mechanism is for us to put the structure together when the federal government oversteps their bounds. In Roe v. Wade, they went back to the First Amendment, the the 14th, the 9th, and within that, found the idea, this idea of privacy. Very important to understand the structure of the 14th Amendment. It was to, in fact, the writers of it, being in the House, talked about the idea that there's no incorporation clause. It was to fix the moral mistake we did by calling certain human beings not property, not human beings. And, under, and to clearly put in the Constitution that they have complete inalienable rights. The right to life, liberty, and property. No such thing as incorporating, because that's why it's important. I, don't, I know what's occurring today. I understand because they keep doing it. It's like saying we've been calling 2 plus 2, 6 whenever we want to. We've got to continue doing that. Now, the answer is we've got to get back to the right core foundation principles. Gravity is always gravity, right? So... When you look back at this, is what's the mechanism for whatever the topic is? What is the mechanism when the federal government breaks its chains of its enumerated powers and mandates to the state or to individuals what it must or must not do that's not there? That's why knowing the structure is so important. Knowing the, uh, the foundation of where we fit in this structure is so very important. So they can't fool us. They can't lead us and say, well, we have the answer because I got a degree from Yale or Harvard or whatever. No, it doesn't matter. It's what does this say? What does the original intent of the maker say? That's the Constitution. So I know I repeat this every week, but I think it's important we understand by knowing this, we could say no to this tyrannical government overreach in every aspect. Number one, the states came before the federal government. The states are actually countries, the 13 colonies, the 13 states. We know that because that's clearly what they said and how they, they talked about themselves at that time. But the individual who formed that society is, is allowing their individual sovereignty and their expression of society to the federal government to allow them to live their life. To make a more perfect union, the federal government was given 18 functions in Article 1, Section 8. So where is abortion? Where is education or health care? We'll go over those in the next topic. But where are they? So that's why the structure that breaks the Constitution down with the legislative branch having 33 functions and the executive 13 and the judicial 6 is broken down. But those are underneath the state where it's not enumerated, where it's not enumerated. That's why these people have to use word uh, gymnastics to manipulate things around and call a person a person at different times arbitrarily. That goes away from God's natural law. That's why we have to always go back to that. A law is not a law if it's in the Constitution or written down or a statute or by the EPA or the IRS or any agency simply because they say so. That's coercion and compulsion. That's not freedom and liberty. But if we don't stand up and say no to that, if we don't act on our sovereignty, then we're going to have a tyrannical government step on our way. That's what George Washington said. That's why it's important to know the position we're in. We're sovereign. We say yes or no to certain things as long as on a fringe on somebody else's. So, the abortion issue in 1997, Congressman Stockton from Texas had a life called the Sanctity of Life Bill. In 19, uh, no, excuse me, that was 1995. In 2007, Senator, uh, Congressman Paul um, did the same bill. And in last year's session, actually, Congressman Brown from Georgia. And was simply stated since we know the Declaration of Independence says that an able right is life, we're having a Sanctity of Life Bill that says life begins at conception. That's it. That's the function. And no support. No support from all these right um, uh, pro-life groups that raise money, have their political influence. Where were they? They were silent. Also, the state legislators, 
because the Ninth and Tenth Amendment and Article Six, Clause Two of the Constitution have the not just the right, their duty bound to say no to the overstepping of the federal government's Leviathan. Where are those states? See, that's why it's important to the structure, because if the goal is just to go back to a a court case and and hope that five out of nine say, okay, let's change the law, that's not the structure. The judges don't have the power to make law. And in the Constitution, there's no number of Supreme Court justices. If you wanted to stack the court with pro-life, put 100 on. See, that's why it's important to know the rules, to know the foundational principles, and never leave that Declaration of Independence. Never leave the philosophy behind it that we're made in our Creator's image, and He bestows us with certain noble rights. Among those, life. Because without life, there is no liberty. There is no pursuit of your dreams. There is not. But the structure is there. We just need men and women to stand up and say no. The question is, where are they? And this is why I started in the very first segment is, I believe now we have one party, the progressive party. The progressive party believes the state is sovereign. The state is in charge. The state knows better to every single minutia, every single minutia of our life. And all they do by staying in power is redistributing our property to their friends to keep them in power and keep their friends happy. That's public-private partnership. That is this idea of cronyism, business welfare, a tax rate for us. I'm going to spend next uh, uh, week talking actually about taxes and fiat currency and money, but just think when the state, the federal government or the state government decides they start doing income tax. In 1913, it started at 3%. Two years later, it was 7%. In 1919, it was 77%. In 1961, it was 91% highest tax bracket. Who are these people arbitrarily telling you how much of your property you can give? When we know true laissez-faire, true free market economics is the greater lift of all shifts and people out of, out of poverty the world's ever seen. But it takes control away from the central state, the central government, and they cannot live with that. That's why it's important that we go back to the structure and the function. We go back to those things. So what I want to do is, with life, is not run away from that issue. Because we hear people say, oh, don't, don't, don't talk about those social issues. The answer is, it is a social and moral issue, but there is a political part in there to stand up for that because it is life. But we cannot vote for a group and compromise on those things. You compromise on life, what else would you compromise on? And we must use our, our brain and ask questions about groups that on both sides on what they get out of it and who they are empowering and with what funds. Life should never be a pawn in any political process, but at the same time, life might be willing, must be willing to fight for. And I believe we can do that with a love and compassion to talk. But we must stand firm and not waver. We do that. I believe we can see this change in our lifetime. Looking at polls today, the next generation coming up, it is actually getting more favorable to support life than the other way. I, I do have a bias in this, being myself, being, being a born-again Christian about the sanctity of life, but also as an OBGYN, I get to see that beautiful little heartbeat when a baby's around three millimeters, three millimeters. I get to see a heartbeat. And those little mommies and daddies that come on in and see that, they're crying with joy because when it's not there, they're crying with sadness. So again, the Declaration declares God's natural law. We have enable right life. The political structure must protect enable rights. I think it's worth a conversation we must have at any time to move something forward. We must hold true to those cornerstone principles. Thank you very much on this segment. And we'll tie it all together with the final one, but I appreciate it very much. Thank you.
Welcome back to our uh, final segment on the constitutional path to liberty. Now, we were talking a lot about the structure and how we um, took together on life, uh, life issues today. I want to spend some time concerning the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is the crux of how we're supposed to be free and protect ourselves. The first law of natural law is self-defense. Then it comes, then it comes liberty and private property. Because without self-defense, without self-defense, you cannot protect the other two. Now I'm going to read the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia, comma, be it necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. How clear is that? Again, the Constitution, the original Constitution before the Bill of Rights, those six pages, limits the federal government to its chains. But at most conventions, and if you read the preamble to the Bill of Rights, it actually states that. It says this. It says, The convention of a number of the states, having at the time of their adopting the Constitution, expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers, the further declaratory and restrictive clauses should be added. And as extending the ground of public confidence in the government will best reinsure the benefits ends of this institution. So, the Constitution, men like Madison did not think a Bill of Rights was important, even Hamilton, because they believed the Constitution was so enumerated, so constructed, so limited, and it would never override the state constitutions because they are two different entities. Jefferson and Henry and others concern that not being enumerated, they may overstep their bounds and get in those fields they're not supposed to get into. So therefore, they restricted that with the Bill of Rights, the original ten. The second one being the Bill of uh, the, um, the the Second Amendment, which is on on their right to bear arms. It actually was the fourth. The first two got pushed back to later on, but. When you look at it, that Second Amendment is important. And I want to go over some of our Founding Fathers' quotes. And I, I know I read fast, but I think it's important to read their words. To disarm the people is the best and most effective way to enslave them. George Mason. Firearms stand next to importance to the Constitution itself. They are the American people's liberty, teeth, and keystone under independence. From the hour of the pilgrims landed to the present day, events, occurrence, and tendencies prove that to ensure peace, security, and happiness, the rifle and pistol are equally indispensable. The very atmosphere of firearms everywhere restrains evil interference. They deserve a place and an honor with all that is good. George Washington the Constitution shall never be constructed to authorize Congress to prevent the people of the United States who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arms. Samuel Adams. How has that changed today? How has that changed? You have pro Second Amendment groups out there that can't, can't, can't compromise. The NRA in 1968 actually compromised on registration. The Gun Owners of America, National, Pro, uh, uh, National Association of Gun Rights, their, their thing is consistent with what I believe here is that the Bill of Rights is over here, is where the federal government cannot infringe, period. Cannot infringe. And the Second Amendment articulates that so beautifully. So beautifully. Our founders who fought for independence who built the, the structure of our government, were the ones that said every individual must be armed. Now today's representatives believe we, have, we are not smart enough or prepared enough to be armed. That's a real sad change in our leadership, but more sad change in us that we ran away from what we believe 
what our founders believed was the essence of our, of our natural rights. One more with Patrick Henry before I move on. Guard with jealousy attention to public liberty. Suspect everyone who approaches that jewel. Unfortunately, nothing will preserve it but downright force. Whatever you give up that force, you are ruined. The great object is that every man be armed. Everyone who is able might have a gun. Patrick Henry. And one more. What country can preserve its liberties if the rulers are not worn from time to time and the people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. And what Jefferson was talking about there is not revolution. He asks us another phrase where he says, when a government fears the people, that's freedom and liberty. When the people free the, fear the government, that's tyranny. And what he must be is that we just got to make sure that we understand that position. We are not demanding a revolution or a, a war. They want to spin those words like that. That's not what it's about at all. It's the right to defend oneself. So why to, to protect your property, your life, your thoughts? So if we have that structure that our founders had and built this company, this country, why are we in this position now? Because we lost those core. I believe the book I talked about before, Carl Lotus is Becker, the Declaration of Independence, a study of history of political ideas. Got to hold the philosophy of what the Declaration came from. So it's important that we spend time knowing ourselves what we believe. That's why it's important to have, again, I'm hoping in the future, um, the media, media people that interviewed myself during this campaign or people on Facebook or Internet, I, I'm, it's an open door, open policy. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to do anything. I just want to come be, you know, we'll talk on the radio, talk in person, talk on the phone. But I would love us to have that that intellectual debate, that intellectual challenge to know where we stand as society and to get these ideas out. Because when you can flush those ideas out and discuss them, we can see where our commonalities were more common than different. We know that. All of us desire to be free. All of us desire to have the American dream and what we believe it's going to be. My lovely little Gracie girl just came back yesterday spending 10 days in an Ethiopian uh, orphanage where she literally was there just to hold people, little girls and boys' hands and smile and bring hearts. In one orphanage she went to, she, uh, when she got there out of the bus, she walks off the bus and a little boy was there smiling for her because she saw the little boy saw her there the last time she was there a couple days ago. Held her hand and walked on in. And about a five, six-year-old little boy, and, and the person who's running the orphanage said, that little boy actually is not here, but we let him in when you come in here to have you know a meal and eat because we're over full to the max, and that little boy actually lives in the street. A five- or six-year-old little boy. See, government doesn't answer that question or that answer. They actually harm that individuals, groups, organizations can make a difference at the individual level. We have to understand that we are the last bastion of that freedom and liberty. We have the opportunity to show that as Washington talked about in his feral address. But we must go back to those core principles and as individuals, individuals share that great idea. The government is just a tool for that to occur, not to redistribute what they believe is more important. What I really hope that we do, as long as, you know, God, when we have this opportunity to speak and talk, is to keep getting deeper and deeper into these issues and not become factoids or things like that, but take the history, the historical context of different issues, take them through today and look at them. Because the answer, the answer is not more government. The answer is not more redistribution of wealth. The answer is not more regulations. The answer is just the opposite. The answer is liberty and freedom with no coercion from a government at any level. That is the true constitutional path to liberty. I thank you so much for these opportunities. I hope to talk to you in the future and enjoy your week. And um, God willing, we'll see you here next uh, uh, Saturday as well. Thank you. WMYT, my talker radio.